Which of these three, in your opinion, proved himself a neighbor to him who fell amongst the robbers? He answered, He who took pity on him. And Jesus said, Go and do thou also in like manner. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. My dear faithful, this gospel today, the most, one of the most famous uh, that we know, the Good Samaritan. Sometimes we forget, I'm sure you've been told before, it is precisely this sort of parable that made our Lord many enemies. Why? It sounds like a very harmless, beautiful lesson. But we forget the history that the Jews hated the Samaritans in general, and the Samaritans hated the Jews. So that our Lord giving this, this story in which the Samaritan is the good guy, in which the Samaritan saves the day, and, all, and the Jews, the priests, and Levite are the bad guys. It's, it's quite a shocking uh, parable our Lord gives to show the Samaritan, the enemy of the Jew, is the one that helps him. It was very well known, the, the, the lack of charity, the, in fact, the hatred between the Jews and the Samaritans. If you remember also, it was even our Lord, because he was a Jew, was rejected at one place. If you read in the Gospels, our Lord is traveling and he's going somewhere and he wants to visit this Samaritan town. And the Samaritans in the town hear that this, this man, this famous man, this Jew, is coming to their village and they go out and they block his entry. That you cannot come in. We do not want you to enter. And he is rejected. And, and James and John are, are with our Lord. And they get very angry, in a sense, rightfully so, the just anger, a very, an anger of justice. How dare they refuse our master to come in just because he's a Jew. And they get very angry, and they tell our Lord, please call down from heaven, fire upon this village, destroy, burn this village to the ground for what they have done, this insult to you and to us, to the Jews. I'm sure there was a bit of a mixture there of the justice of, the, they are rejecting our Lord, but also we hate the Samaritans, and it would be a win-win. We can, they can punish them for their sins and destroy them. I mean, imagine, imagine that sort of thing, saying someone rejected a visit of our Lord, we want them burned to the ground. Imagine, imagine the hatred that is there, the anger, or even maybe it's a just anger. If, if I send Father Novak and Father Gomez to someone's house, and they say, oh, Angmo, get him out of here. I don't want to receive these, uh, these Guelao, get him out of here. Or these Vele uh, Karen, get them out of here. We don't want them. We don't want them. And they come back to me and I say, that's it. I'm bringing fire down. I'm going to burn down your house with you in it. That's the kind of anger that they had between the Samaritans and the Jews. That's how vicious it was. And our Lord takes this beautiful opportunity and says, no, you are filled with the wrong spirit. It's a demonic Spirit, when you want that kind of nasty revenge, that's demonic. That's a wrong spirit. That is not the spirit of God. I have not come on this earth. The Son of Man has not come to destroy the life of man, but to save it. Our Lord makes this very clear. Yes, they might be my enemy. They refuse me, <clears throat> making them my enemy. But I want to save them, not destroy them. Our Lord makes this very clear. And, he, and that's why he gives this parable today. Go and do in like manner like the good Samaritan. You must love your enemies. This is what we speak about today. It's so, such a, a, a difficult lesson. I would say we live in very pagan times. Maybe our countries have always been pagan. Maybe all the countries in the world are now newly pagan again. They've all apostatized, apostatized and therefore they're all neo-pagan. And with paganism comes this hatred this bitterness against others, this selfishness, this inability to forgive because there is no law and virtue of forgiveness. So we have to be very careful. We have to examine ourselves very carefully about this, and we will see why. Why must we love our enemies? And then how do we love our enemies? We'll see those two points today. Why? Why must we love our enemies? Firstly, 
God strictly commands it in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Some of the people think, oh, the Old Testament, you could do all these vicious things. You could be like this, you know, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. No, in the Old Testament, there was also the law of forgiveness. All the way back to Leviticus, Ecclesiasticus, all these books of the Old Testament, they, they show that. You can read. You shall not stand against the blood of your neighbor. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. Do not seek revenge. Do not be mindful of the injury of your people. We read also, remember the last things. Let your enemy en enmities cease. Stop having enemies. Forgive your neighbor if he hurts you, and your sin shall be forgiven when you pray. These are all from the Old Testament. And you see many great figures, saints in the Old Testament, who fulfilled this law, you know, the famous case of Joseph. Joseph is put out into the, the pit, the hole, to die by his brothers, and he forgives them readily. He forgives them for trying to kill him. And not only the Old Testament, of course, in the New Testament, our Lord, our Lord makes very clear, you have heard that it has been said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, do good to them that hate you, Pray for them that persecute and calumniate you. Our Lord makes us crystal clear. And he goes even further, besides the simple command, you know, love those that hate you. He says, it's so important, I'm going to make it dependent upon the forgiveness of your sins. If you cannot forgive your neighbor, God will not forgive you your sins. He makes the forgiveness of sins dependent upon the fulfilling of this law. He makes it crystal clear. If you, will not, if you will forgive men their offenses, your heavenly Father will forgive you also your offenses. But if you will not forgive men, neither will your Father forgive you your sins. It's so clear. It, it's, 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 it's difficult, but it's clear. And not only that, he goes further. It's always one step more. And not only... Will your sins not be forgiven? You will not receive any grace or even salvation. No prayer, no sacrifice, no good work will be at all pleasing to God. Our Lord says, if therefore you offer your gift at the altar, you know, your prayers or good works, and you remember there that you have, your brother has anything against you, there's some sort of enmity, leave there, don't offer your gift, leave it, stop Go home first, or go to this place and be reconciled with your brother, and then coming back, offer your gift. If there's any sort of enmity that's on your side, our Lord says, do not pray, do not offer a gift, do not attend the sacrifice of the Mass and expect grace. Do not receive communion thinking, why am I not receiving any spiritual life? Why do I keep falling in the same sins? Why am I un unhappy all the time? Why is my life always a disaster? I'm doing all the things. I'm doing the work. I'm doing the work. I'm doing the Catholic actions. I'm doing this and that, that and all these things I'm trying to do. And my life isn't moving anywhere. I'm the same miserable loser in the spiritual life that I've been. What's going on? And our Lord says, have you forgiven your brother, your enemy, anyone that you have a, an anger, a hatred towards, you hold out a grudge towards another person for injuring you now or in the past or continuously, doesn't matter. You must forgive them. You must have a love for them. Otherwise, your sins are not forgiven. They're still on your soul. Or, maybe forgiven, but you're not receiving any more graces. You're just sterile because there is no possibility for God's grace to penetrate the soul. Our Lord is very clear. So our Lord, our Lord commands this, Old Testament, and very clearly in the New Testament. But it's not just our Lord's command, or the command of God. Our Lord also gives us the example. He says, what I ask you to do, what I tell you to do, I will do to the highest level, to the perfect level. He gives us a most splendid example in, in his life. You could talk about his, his, his childhood, but you could talk about his public life. He is surrounded at all times by so many enemies who, who envy him. They hate him. They persecute him. They call his miracles works of the devil. They misrepresent his doctrine. They misrepresent everything he wants to do. They say, oh, you're seducing the people. You're turning them against this. You're turning them against this. They even try to stone him. They, they try to corner him. They try to trap him. 
And how does he conduct himself to these people? He suffers these things and he forgives them. He corrects them. He says, no, that is not correct. What you are saying is wrong. But he forgives them. And then, of course, his passion, his death, it is nothing but a masterpiece of how much we should suffer for those who, who persecute us. Our Lord is apprehended, unjustly bound as a, as a criminal, put, condemned to death, dragged, crowned, whipped, spit upon, mocked, rejected by all those, all these enemies who he is trying to save. Finally, he's crucified between two thieves, and he suffers patiently and silently, only speaking about them insofar as he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. How can we see this and still bear that hatred or bitterness or anger towards those who have injured us? How could we refuse to forgive them? So we see our Lord does not ask of us anything that he himself has not already done to the highest level. And sometimes, you know, we, we think this person has done the greatest thing, the most terrible thing. It's, it's this enormous thing that they have done. It's this Mount Everest of insult or injury or calumny or detraction against me. And it's, it's actually like this big or it's just in our own minds. It's not actually really nothing's been done. They just think that. And our Lord's like, listen, I, I suffered for a real thing, a real insult. And how many times have we sinned against God, which is the greatest possible attack of an enemy against God? So let us be uh, following our Lord's example in this matter. And it's not only our Lord, but the saints. St. Paul says this. We are reviled and we bless. We are persecuted. We suffer it. We are blasphemed and we entreat. And we have Saint, the example of St. Stephen as well, who St. Paul, Paul knows embarrassingly well since he was there. St. Stephen as being stoned as the first martyr. Lord, do not put this sin upon them. Do not lay this sin upon their charge. There are many examples, hundreds, thousands of examples of the lives of the saints where they are being attacked, persecuted by their fellow Catholics sometimes, sometimes by non-Catholics, and they suffer silently and they forgive them. There's a famous case in the early centuries of St. Sabinus. You might have heard of St. Sabinus, the bishop. He was, um, he was arrested by the local Roman governor and as a, as a punishment, as let's say a, a way to make him leave the faith or punish him, they cut off both of his hands. So he just had stumps. And that was supposed to be the initial phase of torture of, you know, now you're going to change your ways. Of course he doesn't. And not only that, he hears through his contacts that the governor has a, a mysterious, uh, let's say, I don't know if they're called migraine headaches or something wrong with his head, some kind of torturous pain in his head behind his eyes, some sort of terrible uh, disease. And the stumpy Sabinus goes over there, prays over him, laying his stumps upon him, and heals him. Heals the governor who has just cut off his hands. That is forgiveness to the highest level. And of course, even more interesting, the governor converted and his family, and they were put to death. They were beheaded for their faith. You see what the mercy and the love of our enemies can do. He just, Sabinus lost a couple of hands and made martyrs. Made martyrs. He didn't make them. He gained martyrs for heaven by his forgiveness of his enemies. Again, he made saints. So, Many th you can go through any lives of the saints. You can see so many beautiful examples of this forgiveness of injuries and the praying uh, for the grace of the enemies, the love of the enemy. It's something very Catholic, very, at the very heart of our Catholic faith. So it is clear our Lord commands it. Our Lord gives us the example. All the saints give us those examples as well. So we know why it, it must be done. It is dependent upon so many things. Secondly, we can look at the question of how. How must we love our enemies? Because this is the real painful part. You can say, theoretically, okay, I see it's necessary, but what's the, usually hear this question, Father, what do I, uh, I hate this person. I know I can't hate them. What do I need to, how do I need to act towards them? What's the bare minimum I need to do to, to stay in grace and not be sinful against them? 
which is the wrong way to ask it, but I can see the point. It's what do we need to do? How should we behave towards those who are against us, those who maybe you have a personal enemy, maybe it's someone in the family, maybe it's someone else, it doesn't matter. How do we behave? Well, firstly, the law of Catholic faith says that we must love our enemies from the heart. That is to say, not just externally, there must be an interior disposition because love is something that comes from inside out. It's not just faking it and pretending to be something. It is, it is from the heart. And we have, again, so many examples. You have this famous example. Just a few months ago, I had the opportunity to stop at the, the home village or the home, the, the original home of St. Maria Garetti in, in Italy, not the place where she was died, which is over by Rome. This is the opposite side of the country. And you have there the home and also the burial place of her mother, Ma, uh, um, Mama Assunta, they call her. So if you remember the story of Maria Goretti, it, it was, there are several layers of forgiveness of enemies in here. It's fantastic. Uh, and in very recent, the last century, a little, a little more than a century ago, this young lady, this teenage girl, she is working. Uh, her, her father has died and her mother, they've want, gone somewhere far over, away from their home to work, to, to be able to have food to eat. They're very poor. And they're working together with another family, sharing lodgings. And this young, uh, young man, uh, let's say older teenage boy, uh, wants to make uh, Maria commit a sin. And she fights him off. And he's so angry, so filled with it, rage that he stabs her 14 times. And she t takes about 24 hours for her to die in this state. Of course, the young man's arrested, put in prison. But the priest asks her as she's dying, as she's, she's, she's dying in incredible pain for 24 hours. He says, do you forgive your murderer? And she says, for the love of Jesus, I forgive him. And I want him to be with me in heaven. Not only do I forgive him, but from the heart, I want to see him in heaven. How difficult would that be to say? That's a beautiful example of free will cooperating with the grace of God. Because our Lord Jesus Christ loves him, I want to forgive him, and I want him to be with me in paradise. And not only that, it is said at the early, the first few years in prison, this Alessandro was his name. Alessandro was in prison. They said he was like a diabolical young man. He was in fits of rage, acting, maybe possessed, I don't know, but acting insanely. A just miserable creature. And then he writes that after, I think, eight years in prison, uh, he, he, he's at night, he's, he's sleeping, and he's awoken, and there's a Maria Goretti appears to him with 14 uh, white, uh, white flowers flowers of the 14 of the times he stabbed her. And uh, she speaks to him, and he, and he converts. At that moment, he receives the grace to, to, to repent of his sins. And, and he becomes such a model prisoner that they let him go early. They let him go a few years early from his sentence. And his first thing is he leaves the prison, goes all the way back across the country to Mama Asunta, the mother of Maria, the one he killed. And he begs her forgiveness, and she forgives him. Not only does she forgive him, she adopts him as a member of her family. And you can go today to where she is buried in her home village, and he is buried right next to her. Being buried next to the murder of your daughter, that is Catholic forgiveness. That is a love of our enemies that we can only dream of, that we, we should be aiming towards. You're buried next to the one who killed your, your wonderful daughter, your saintly daughter. Whew. That's impressive. So we must forgive them interiorly from the heart, have a benevolent feeling towards them. We should not wish them evil. It's so easy when you hear news of them, oh, that enemy of mine, oh, something bad happened. Oh, wonderful, what a great day. I should celebrate. Let's open the champagne. This is a great day. It's so easy. It's a, it's a really dangerous temptation. We should wish them well. We should have a love towards them. Not easy, but that, that is, those feelings, they come up. Those feelings of anger, of revenge, of these sorts of things, they're, they're sort of human natures, maybe a self-defense thing, but that doesn't mean they're right. They're, it's not a sin for that feeling to come into your heart. It's a sin if you consent to keep it there and not push it out and say, no, this is ridiculous, I must forgive them. Your emotions don't always obey you, but you have to work on them. You have to work on making them obey you. 
So these feelings arise, but we must push them out and say, these are wrong. So it must be a, a love of your enemies from your heart. Secondly, in word, there's another thing that becomes very painful for people, to be able to speak to their enemies, the person who has harmed them, the person who has injured them, the person who has betrayed them. It doesn't mean you have to have a long, intimate conversation like best friends, but it has to be civil and charitable. You cannot avoid them. You cannot turn away your eyes and say, I refuse to look at you, or I will never speak to you again as long as I live. That is not Catholic. You hear that many times in families. Oh, we have not been speaking for 10 years, 20 years, because they insulted me, they said something bad about me, they corrected me, they did this, they did that. And people turn into this horrible creature of bitterness and this cancerous uh, feeling of anger or hatred just grows inside their souls. It's horrible. It's really nasty. It's, it's diabolical. And that needs to be removed. There must be the ability, maybe not right away, maybe when someone in horribly hurts you, maybe there's a few days or a week where you have to sort of get yourself under control and, and avoid them temporarily, but it cannot be a persevering situation. There must be those charitable words, those simple greetings, even if possible, after some time, trying to make peace with them. Even though maybe you're not at fault, maybe. Although we are not always the best judge if we're at our own fault. We always assume it's the other person. And the other person makes the same mistake, maybe. But there must be, at some point, even if it's just by simple acts, saying, yes, I'm praying for you. I'm sorry if I've caused you any harm, or maybe you've misunderstood me, whatever. Regardless of what it is, I apologize. Even though you may think, I don't know that I made any mistake, but in case I did, I've known to be wrong. I am human. I can make mistakes. Therefore, it's okay to have a, a general apology. It's okay. You don't apologize for something you're certain you did not do, but you can apologize in general that maybe there was a misunderstanding, possibly. You say, that person, it's their fault, injustice, they must apologize to me. Maybe that's true injustice. But in charity, we still have the duty to seek peace with them. Justice and charity have the same weight in this regard. So let us be also loving our enemies in word. Try to speak well of them. Try to speak well. And that's all. It's not an easy thing. But our Lord gives us the grace for that. And not only that, he says, I will only give you grace. I will only forgive you your sins if you make these efforts to love your enemies in thought, in word, and in action. How do we love our enemies in action? Firstly, of course, by praying for them. Our Lord says that just clearly. Pray for those that persecute and calumniate you. He says this uh, as he's dying. Father, forgive them, and they do not know what they are doing. All the saints, St. Stephen and many others, prayed as they were being horribly tortured and killed. They prayed for their enemies. We cannot exclude our enemies from our prayers. That would be directly against Catholic charity and love of our neighbors. There will be temptations that we never want to think about them again or pray for them. You have to get over that. You have to uh, work on that. It takes time, but it needs to be a, an effort in that direction. Or even doing good to them. St. Alphonse de Ligori calls this the revenge of the saints. Sort of a humorous way of speaking, because of course revenge is not good. Revenge is to the Lord, not to us. But they talk about the revenge of the saints, meaning they return good for evil. They follow the example of our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave his life for his enemies and shed his precious blood for his enemies. And they say, I will do good to those who harm me. I will try my best in all humility and gentleness when the occasion arises to help them, to say a good word to them, to give them something if need be, to have mass said for them, to pray for them, to do some good action for them. These little acts of, of charity are how we prove our love of our enemies. So my dear faithful, it's a lot to, to digest, but a very important lesson for us in these days there is no forgiveness of sin. There is no grace. There is no salvation if we live at enmity with any of our fellow mankind. In our hearts, firstly, forgive them from the very depths of your heart, even though it's difficult. Forgive your enemy and offer, when possible, 
peace. Be at peace with everyone insofar as you're concerned. Maybe they will reject you for the next 50 years. Maybe they will not. They will, they will slap away your hand of offering of reconciliation. They will refuse you. Maybe. But insofar as you are concerned, we must forgive them from the very bottoms of our heart if we wish our sins to be forgiven, if we wish the grace of God, if we wish to imitate our Lord Jesus Christ and have eternal life, that God will forgive our sins who will receive us as his most beloved children into everlasting happiness of heaven. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.